Hi, this is Jacob Johnston, the writer and director of the upcoming film Dreamcatcher, and you're listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker and the graveyard is open. Welcome inside, everybody. Welcome back for those of you that are my regular listeners out there. And for those of you that are new listeners to the program, welcome inside my graveyard. What took you so long to get here? Um, Take a look around. Enjoy the surroundings. And um, as you can see, there are plenty of shows for you to catch up and listen to. Um, 28 other shows, uh, to be exact, um, 27 other shows plus one best of, of 2020. So there you have it. Um, but yes, welcome everyone. It's great to have all of you here. And, um, well, it's really interesting as we enter the month of March, uh, I realized that this is actually the third year the Graveyard Show podcast is online. Uh, version two of the Graveyard Show podcast, I should say, because version one of the show uh, lasted 19 months. Uh, I started it in January of 2009, and it ended July of 2010. So um, a much different, <laughs> much different schedule back then. It was a weekly show back then, uh, did upwards of almost 80 shows in those 19 months. Uh, right now on my 29th show, uh, starting uh, my third year. So a little different. But uh, in a bit, I'll tell you um, what I'm doing to celebrate the third anniversary of the show. Uh, or I should say starting the third year of the show. And uh, I'll get into that in a minute, because as you heard at the top of the show, uh, Jacob Johnston's going to be joining me here in just a moment. He is the writer and director of the new film Dreamcatcher, which starting March 5th is available on digital and on demand. So you can catch it uh, in those formats. And we will talk about his film in just a few moments. It's really, really good. It's a solid film and a very different type of slasher film. Uh, Also, um, uh, let's see if he'll talk about his time with the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He did some work, actually did a lot of work on a lot of the uh, Marvel uh, films that came out. So uh, let's see if we can get him to talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, In the meantime, if you'd like to reach out to this program, you could do so at uh, the email address gyspodcast at gmail.com. gyspodcast at gmail.com. That is how you can reach out to me. Uh, Send me thoughts, comments, uh, suggestions, platitudes. Yeah, you can tell me how awesome I am as a host and caretaker of this here graveyard. And also, if you're part of the horror community, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out as well. Um, if you're looking to uh, promote something that you're working on, please do not hesitate. Uh, send me an email and uh, we'll work something out, getting uh, word out on whatever project it is you are working on. Stay tuned uh, to the other side of this interview, because as I mentioned, I will get into uh, what I'm doing to celebrate the start of the third year of the Graveyard Show podcast online. Um, Also, I have some news regarding uh, the new film coming out by director uh, Josh Rubin, who, of course, did the film Scare Me, which uh, I believe is still on Shutter right now. I'll tell you about his upcoming project, and um, I'll also get into uh, next show. Uh, It's going to be a first for the Graveyard Show podcast. I'll get into that in just a little while because as you hear in the background, a new grave is being added. And when that happens, it can only mean one thing. My guest is here and it's time for me to get to work. Jacob Johnston is the writer-director of the new horror film Dreamcatcher, which centers on two estranged sisters and their friends who must survive a 48-hour whirlwind of violence and mayhem at an underground music festival. The film can be seen on demand and on digital starting March 5th. Uh, Jacob has also written for the TV series The Luxy and Sunny Family Cult, and uh, it is great to welcome Jacob into the graveyard. Jacob, thanks for joining me. I appreciate the time. 
Of course. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Well, congratulations on the film. Uh, for those that are not familiar with Dreamcatcher, why don't you tell everyone what the film is about? Absolutely. I'm kind of going off what you said. It's following two two sisters who, uh, you know, falling out in their relationship, come together at this uh, kind of 90s grunge underground EDM festival. And uh, while, while at the festival, some traumatic drug induced things go down and the rest of the film follows the the fallout of uh this kind of traumatic event um which also uh sees the appearance of a masked killer who is seemingly hunting down the kids so where did the idea uh for the story come from yeah it was it was two things really uh when i <clears throat> i'd known the producers brandon and Kristen uh, crystal for for a very long time and we both shared kind of a love for 90s ensemble horror and uh so when they came to me and they were like hey we you know we got the financing we want to make a movie we we, you know we want to do kind of a love letter to the 90s um and we'd love you know some element of music uh to be involved in the story in some capacity and the the rest of it was up to my own devices so i I kind of took a couple days and started milling about what, what could work and what was great about the edm in was one, it's such a zeitgeist cultural movement that, you know, is happening in the last 10, 15 years. But also, you know, the idea of introducing a, a character with a mask, <clears throat> it was kind of like a no brainer. You know, we got Dead Mouse, we got Marshmallow, we've got Daft Punk. And those are characters who, who regularly wear masks. So there wasn't really going to be a buy in for the audience to be like, why is there a character wearing a mask? And then you can take that mask and put it on anybody's head. And it's not kind of like a strange uh, or, or a long mythos that we have to explain, like, where did this come from? Why does it exist? You know, so it's kind of like those are the baseline elements in, in terms of the, the foundation of the story. So you mentioned 90s movies um, and uh, being yeah. a fan of them. Um, I'm wondering if there were any particular films from that uh, decade that were influencing you for this. Because when I when I saw it, I saw it as a part slasher, uh, part giallo. Um, and I was yes. wondering if there were any films from that time period as well that might have uh, influenced you for this film. Absolutely. It's, it's exactly that. It's, you know, we had to appeal to the modern audiences in terms of like, for me, a film like Scream, uh, and I know what you did last summer are great because it focuses on a smaller cast and really lets us get to know the characters, uh, before just, you know, axing them off. Um, and, and with, with the Geller films, it was, it was like, <laughs> uh, Tenebrae and Suspiria and, um, these, these movies that used color, and and use them as a character in themselves and what was great about again the edm world was there was a natural reason to use these colors that wasn't just like color for the sake of style you know so i was able to imbue those contrast elements that i I really loved um in a meaningful way that didn't just feel like oh he's doing a you know a neon horror movie because he thinks it's got a cool style to it um so it kind of it was it was a nice thing to not have to be like well i'm i'm doing it you know it felt justified in a narrative sense too and it and it really turned out really well. Uh, and I actually I'll hit you up on that in just a minute because um, what I one of the first things that kind of stuck out uh, with this film for me was that it's 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 a slasher giallo, but it's a very different type of slasher film. I noticed yep. that you just don't set up a group of characters that are there for the slaughter. Um, I, you really rely on the cast and the characters. Uh, with their relationships and also I mean you actually touch on something that's rare in horror films is grief that happens yeah. um, uh, maybe hereditary was is a movie that comes uh, up recently uh, that mm-hmm. that touched on that touches on grief um, and and characters supporting each other uh, that you normally wouldn't see in a, in a typical slasher film I mean how much time did you put in when you started creating the story in these characters a lot of time for me that's that's where the writing process really starts um i think if i get too bogged down in like plot mechanics then suddenly the characters just start to feel like a product of that right where if it's like i mean inevitably you're gonna have to find how those characters function as you know a mechanic within the story but if i know who they are and i know why they are before i start putting them into what needs to happen within the story then it gives me a more well-rounded view and, and it also gives me a, a little bit of leniency with how that character evolves through the story. At the end of the day, at least, you know, for me, I, I believe it, it relates to the audience a lot more. Because, you know, when you go into seeing these films, you can go in with the mindset of, like, 
can't wait to watch people get gutted in the craziest way, you know, or if you, <laughs> yeah. or if you, if you can surprise people, um, hopefully by saying, well, yeah, that, that can happen. But also, like you said, there is an element of support and seeing how trauma affects people, I, I think is a really interesting thing because it doesn't just happen in one way. It's, you know, it's, it's crippling for some people. It's motivating for other people. And there's, you know, there's this gray area when it comes to grief and, and it comes to trauma and, I really wanted to see how that affected these different people who had, at the surface may not feel like they really come together in, in a meaningful way, but then you start to see, you know, how it affects all of these people differently um, and what, what it drives them to do throughout the film. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's interesting because without giving anything away, uh, you have one character trying to console another character and basically saying, you know, one thing and the other character turns around and is just is basically like, look, I'm in pain. I'm hurting. You know, I'm grieving. And I, yeah. it just really kind of stood out to me. So I'm like, well, this is something I would see in a drama. And sure. it's really refreshing to see that in in a film like this, because, yeah, I mean, normally, you know, you, you, you yeah, back in the old days, you buy your ticket, you go into the theater, you know what you're going to get. And with this, yeah. you know, obviously there's certain rules that you're going to play by, but also you're you're going, yeah, but you may think that this is it's this type of movie, but it's really this type of movie as well. And, and it was really it was really refreshing to see um, your cast did an amazing job in the film. It must have been really good seeing them bring these characters to life. So I'm wondering how long did it take to do the casting? process for this uh we started in november um of 2018 and uh we were casting through christmas which was um it, it, the industry really shuts down in december like two yeah. weeks in it's like you know getting people to answer the phone is Forget a tedious it. task <laughs> yeah. oh yeah <laughs> so we're we're trying to like you know this was pre-covid so we were doing it the old-fashioned you know we, we were bringing people into the room and, and i it really made it a point, you know, you watched the making of these old eighties and nineties ensemble films. And like the casting process was so important because it was like, if these characters have no chemistry, then the movie doesn't work. Exactly. And so, you know, we really took the time to say, okay, here's all the people we like from self tapes. Let's bring them in. And then we started doing mix and matches, like just bringing these people together and making sure that even if it's not like perfect chemistry, that there is a connection there, um, you know, that we can massage and, and polish throughout. But we got really lucky because these people just just found each other and then when we were on set um obviously when you're low budget uh you don't have trailers for everybody so we had this like giant party bus oh, nice. and, and it was just a great way you know it, it was huge but it was like they could just sit in there between takes or they could you know when we were shooting at the warehouse and stuff like it really gave them the opportunity to bond on a personal level and not just as their characters um you know, it's, it's 2 a.m. and they're sitting there having a coffee and discussing, you know, their lives. And I thought that really, you know, in, even in talking to them about it, it did help bring them together um, in a meaningful way. So I was really glad that that kind of worked out the way it did. Well, yeah, and it shows, you know, it shows in the film because you believe that these characters, you know, based on even outside of their, you know, in their real relationships, you could you could tell that, that, that there is a chemistry there and that there is uh, more than just pages of, 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 uh, of script. I mean, it's just, sure. it's just, you know, you can, you can see that because there are some movies where it's like, you kind of look at it and you go, yeah, this no way. And there are others where you go, wow, that really works. So well, well done with that. Um, thank you very much. One, one of the things too, is that you have great female characters in the film. You have Pierce, you have Ivy, uh, Ray, Josephine. And what I like is that there's a consistency and it really felt natural, um, that they were strong, uh, uh, uh female characters but it wasn't like oh here's the one token strong female character and then you have the rest that are just kind of there uh, i'm yeah. sure all of your actresses really appreciated the material when they got the script i i think it, it was that I, I think what was really exciting was the response you know when you're when you're at a certain budget level you, you don't necessarily get the wide array of actors and what we we got over seven thousand submissions because of the material wow and you know in in and that's across, you know, that's across whatever the nine key roles. But still, it's like the ability to have a conversation with people who actually latch on to the content and they're not looking at it as like, oh, it's a genre film because those get written off so much, you know. But there is, I think the horror genre does lend itself to to uh, heady, exciting, impactful commentary, um, you know, and, and actors will latch on to that. And I think with the female characters in this, I wanted to be very careful because it's like it can quickly become ham-fisted or, or 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 comical or like you said, if you're just like 
oh, it's the final girl. I, she's weak from the beginning and then she's going to grow strong and overcome whatever. And it's like, I don't know if there's really a, a crippling thing about like feeling weak about something. You know, you can still be strong and have a moment of, of grief. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. And I think, you know, with, with someone like <clears throat> Ivy, who's, who's obviously come from grief, who's putting herself in a place of trying to be okay. And then she's forced back into grief but she still grows from like, it's, it's never this moment of destitution. And I think that you can easily slip into that where it's just like, I'm so broken. I have nothing. And it's like, nah, that's not really how people work. Some people, when they, they break, they really come back together. Yeah. Um, even with somebody like Ray, a, a tertiary character, it's like, you can have a girl who's extremely smart and she's, you know, well-educated and she's whip smart, but she's still maybe a little self-obsessed because she has these crippling insecurities. So mm -hmm. it's like, how can you explore, maybe some some modern themes but also looking back at just like very simplistic you know foundational elements of humans yeah that people can go yeah i know that person exactly well that's the thing you know it's like even with like right like you're gonna you're gonna be terrified if you're in a club by yourself in in an area and there's this you know menacing character with a mask <laughs> coming after you you know i mean <laughs> i think people forget you know halloween you know jamie lee curtis as strong of a character as she was she was still scared and you would be who Absolutely. wouldn't be if you have this 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 thing coming at you that's going to kill you i mean i think all of us would have a, a sense of fear and dread at some point it, it's so i that's what i that's what i loved about this is that you have it where it's like it's believable and you know the fact that ray's sure. like you know we're gonna we're gonna not you know this isn't over and we're gonna keep fighting and and josephine's character is really interesting because you know it's so believable you know because you could see that you know here she is in this position it's just like yeah, yeah. i believe that she's done anything and everything to make sure that uh what needs Needs to be done is done so yeah. i mean really it, it's it's so it was really well done uh, with your script and obviously you. with your acting so um I, what uh getting back now to the lighting and everything um i w watching the sequences and seeing because obviously you're in a club so it's gonna have a lot of dim lighting you're gonna have a lot of neon lighting and, and all kinds of effects how much planning did you and your director of photography uh, matthew plaxico do a lot uh it was it was very it was it was very but it was very syncopated because in our early meetings um you know i brought him probably 65 70 images that were just really inspiring to me and, and i was like this is what i want you know this is the atmosphere and immediately it was just like okay here's how we'll have to do this and here's how we need to do this and and i'm a big storyboarder as well so even though it's like <laughs> stick figures yeah but like <laughs> being able to talk through the staging and composition, like something I wanted to stay away from is just like over the continuous over the shoulder shots where it's like, how can we try to, you know, create a little bit of tension through the way we even place the actors. So we're not just co you know constantly jumping from, from over the shoulder to over the shoulder. I wanted to stay away from like the overuse of dolly shots because mm -hmm. there was, there was a certain stillness, you know, even though this movie revolves around something kind of chaotic, that yeah. to introduce a, a certain level of stillness into the film, a little bit of, of, a claustrophobia with how we're kind of almost always in medium like there was there were certain things that he was just like super on board with and 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 by the time we got to set it was like him being one step ahead and <clears throat> i really appreciated that because i think you know the the death of the f death of film is like lighting setups that take four hours yeah. and then you're behind and, and we never had that so you know i think that the, the planning that went into it and his creative like out of the box thinking like some of the ways he would light certain things um and we also got kind of lucky one of the producers was was close with a big lighting designer who does concert setups and they were wrapping a like jay-z show or something like and, and they had all this equipment and he was like we can come do the setup you know for the stage lighting for for a couple days and wow. so we got kind of like it was like a serendipitous thing which is why you know we were able to get kind of the big setup in the club but yeah um but working with plaxico he, he was just uh really smart and an innovative person um even when it's not even in the club like i wanted that david fincher sodium vapor feel in the house and he was like great let's you know let's do that let's find ways to to do that with lamps and, and be as practical as possible so yeah it was, it was a really great collaborative um, relationship what um what uh so obviously it was a digitally shot film so how, how what, mm -hmm. what what did you use for for cameras for for the uh for the shooting we shot on the we shot on the Alexa, the full body Alexa, um, which was great in a lot of ways. But that that camera is actually huge. Um, 
So when we were doing, you know, for instance, like uh, the scenes and in, in there's a, a sequence in the bathroom stalls with Ray mm -hmm. and we built, you know, these stalls <laughs> like trying to get Matt Plaxico is a, a pretty big guy too. Uh, him holding, you know, we had like the scorpion setup where that kind of helps balance the camera. Mm -hmm. And we, it was just like nearly impossible to get in these very tight spaces. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's again, just trying to find creative solutions to that and, and how we can finagle it sure, uh, but yeah, yeah it was it was it was a full body big one it's a big dance making a movie on this mm -hmm. <laughs> it really is um another thing that was uh that, that struck me was um if you wound up shooting a lot of nights uh, into early mornings my head started to hurt when i thought of that <laughs> um but then i thought well maybe they maybe they didn't have to because they were shooting inside so was it more of a day shoot a day for night or were you actually doing a lot of night Shot, uh, night shooting into morning. We were doing a lot of night shooting in the morning because in that Ouch. warehouse, the, the backdrop <laughs> is windows, uh. and and it's like it's like twelve or fourteen feet of windows, and it was like, yeah. okay, camera team, we're gonna you know we're gonna black these out. No, so we'd start like around seven to get the lighting all set up, yeah. and then. And then at the end of the film, at the release party sequence, also all nights. Um, <laughs> so I, I would say three fourths of the shoot was nights, but, uh, but everybody was a pretty, you know, great trooper for it. Yeah. That's a hard turnaround <laughs> on the body. That's a, that's a tough yeah. one. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, there's something that happens at like, like two or 3 AM where people get a second wind and suddenly mm -hmm. it's this like reinvigoration of, yeah, we're shooting and it's three in the morning and we're, <laughs> we're, we're hopped up on caffeine and like we're yeah. tired and emotionally exhausted but i don't know they just everything kind of comes back around it's, it's kind of fascinating yeah what um what kind of shooting schedule were you on how many days 17 oh um, wow yeah 17 days yeah so and it, it it was tight to the point of there was some things that actually ended up changing in terms of like one of the death scenes uh, at the end of the film <clears throat> changed because it was supposed to happen outside and it, the one day during the shoot is like pouring rain oh. um, in Los Angeles, which also never happens. No. So, you know, <laughs> we had to rewrite this sequence and, and make, make sense. And um, it also changed the dynamic of the finale because the finale was supposed to happen indoors. But because I moved that death scene indoors, I moved the finale outside, which in the end, actually, I, I felt worked so much better. But, you know, you can't really predict how rain's going to throw oh, yeah. a wrench in your plan it's amazing how much it rains when it rains in la it's amazing how hard it comes down i i can't even believe oh, it sometimes yeah. i'm like what what happened it's almost like a torrential <laughs> downpour here and i'm like it doesn't rain here and then all of a sudden it seems like it's trying to make up for all the lost rain in a year in one night so yeah I, I, <laughs> exactly I, I, I hear what you're saying um so you're um your composer for the film, uh, Alexander Taylor, um, yep. was the idea for him to do uh, the score as well as uh, the EDM for the film, or did you wind up doing? Uh, ED did you wind up getting uh, separate EDM cues uh, for the film. How, how did that work out? Um, Alexander, I brought on really to focus at the time. It was really going to be to focus only on the score. Um, he, he's such a genre guy. He just, he, you can name any film in the last 60 years and be like, Oh, it was this person. And they use this intro. Like he's just this wealth of, of musical knowledge. Um, and you know, I talked to him about the EDM stuff and he was like, it's not quite in my wheelhouse. You know, I'm happy to do the synth, you know, the, the, the synth side of it, but like, it's not really my world. And it kind of was, it worked out better because we found about five or six different EDM artists and, uh, they actually made original tracks for the film. So even the, tracks in the film the edm songs were not licensed they were they were you know created for the yeah. film so we ended up getting some you know quite a lengthy list of, of music cues which is great because it was part of what i loved about the 90s was soundtracks yeah you know like there was a reason you wanted to go out and buy it or, or listen to it afterwards because you're like man i really love that song so it, it was a really awesome thing to be able to, to to have a score and a soundtrack um and you know have have actual edm artists creating that world for us. That's great. It takes the pressure off them too. And then it doesn't get awkward yeah. if it's not, if it's not working out, you know, at least you have <laughs> focusing on, on composing the score and the score was, I mean, that popped out to me immediately. Um, Thank you. It, it's really well done. Um, so in another life, you worked as a visual department producer. Um, yeah. Now is that, is that in visual effects? It's not. And it's funny because I feel like everybody 
always thinks that and and it's tough because it was such a marvel specific visual development also exists in animated films and typically that means like big character design and the storyboards but when marvel created it um it was about visual continuity between all of their movies and it was the department that was designing all of the key characters all of the key you know villains and weapons and like helping to figure out action sequences and and uh also like you know like how does magic work? How do these Iron Man suits work? What are the practical elements of like, it, it was kind of a, a Marvel specific thing. And I'm, I'm sure it's going to be adopted into these, you know, like how Warner brothers are now doing a shared universe. I'm, I'm sure it'll become more of a popular thing. Gotcha. Um, but so, yeah, it, yeah, it was less about the effects. So like if Loki's in the Thor movies and then they want to use them in like, let's just say Spider-Man and uh, then they would come to you and go, we need the look of Loki or, or you guys would then come yep. in and go, here's, here's what Loki's worn so far. This is his look. Yep. And then the, the artist would conceptualize like working with the costume designer, obviously and stuff to, to conceptualize what's his new hero look going to be or, gotcha. um, yeah. Or like, how does his power set change? Yeah. Um, and what does that look like? Yeah, yeah it makes like sense. That. I mean, you you know, you're talking about a decade's worth of movies that are all trying to be, you know, in some form of continuity. So yeah, it would only make sense. Wow. Um, I mean, you you did a lot of them. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Homecoming, Guardians Two, Doctor Strange. I mean, there are just so many. I could I could spend an entire show just listing them all. So that must have been quite an experience. <laughs> how, how did you wind up getting involved in in, in that? Um, it was it was kind of a serendipitous thing. I was interning actually in Marvel animation during my final semester at film school. And my internship supervisor, um, she was like, Hey, I'm going to have you sit down like kind of as an exit thing with this guy, Jeremy Latcham, who was one of the EVPs of production and development. And I was like, Oh, great. This is going to be, you know, my, my one time, my 20 minute window to try to get a job. Uh, and it was a really great conversation because at the time my emphasis in, in film school was actually production design because I, I had looked at, you know, the roster of directors and there were 65 of my colleagues in film school who were directing emphasis. And I was like, I'm going to get lost. I'm going to be just another thesis film that, that I spend 15, 20, $30,000 on. And like, maybe it's a calling card, but also like, who knows? And there were three production designers and I was like, yeah, but I could, I could go this route. I could work on lots of sets. Um, and really hone, you know, my, my visual uh, vision and, and how to tie that to the narrative. You know, I think you look back at Joe Johnston and Tim Burton and Catherine Hardwick and Robert Eggers, like these people who were artists or production designers or art directors who turned into filmmakers. And I kind of looked at it that way. And so I, you know, chose that. And so when I was sitting down with Jeremy and talking about like, my goal was at the time to be a production designer. He's like, Oh, well that's, much easier than if you had come in and said you want to be a producer. <laughs> he's like, he's like, there's a clear path, you know, to becoming a production designer. And, and, and from that, I actually got placed in this department. It was, it was created. I was brought in as the coordinator and it was like me and three of these artists who had been there for a while. And so it was kind of like this inception and it, it changed and grew, you know, as my time there, it became less on the, the administrative side and more on the creative side. I got to be in all of the like, development meetings and uh, story conversations. And so I really got to learn how these movies were put together from, from development all the way through post. And I, I, it's just such an invaluable, you know, just being able to absorb all of that. That really um, is. That is incredible. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it, it changed. You know, I, I really did want to focus on writing and directing. So I was trying to do music videos and short films and, and whatever free time I had during my days at Marvel. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of how it all shook out. But again, it's, it's experience is translatable in any way that you can actually make it, you know? So I'm grateful for, for any and all of it. That's awesome. Well, you've did, you've, you've done a hell of a job with this film. Um, if people want to follow either the film online or if they want to follow you online, where, where can they go? Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at Jake underscore squared. It's probably where I'm most active. I have an Instagram, but it's mostly just pictures of my hedgehog. Um, and then the uh, the film is Dreamcatcher, the movie, Excellent. on Instagram and on Twitter. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Well, you heard him, folks. Jacob Johnston, he is the writer-director of the new horror film Dreamcatcher. It's available starting March 5th on demand on digital. Jacob, this was a real pleasure. Uh, I really look forward to having you back on the program again. Uh, thank you for joining me. I, thank you so much. This was, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And as I put this interview to rest, I really want to thank uh, Jacob for joining me on the program. Um, the film is really solid. It's really different, very interesting stuff. Um, I highly recommend you check it out when you can. Again, uh, starting March 5th, uh, the film is available on demand, on digital. Dreamcatchers, the movie, check it out when you can. Great stuff, too, on uh, Jacob's time with Marvel. Um, it's really interesting to me uh, to hear about stuff like that. It's kind of like behind behind the scenes where uh, you kind of get an idea as to like what the workflow is for this stuff. Because, I mean, I don't know about you. Um, you know, for me, it's like when you hear Marvel, you kind of have this sort of general idea as to like what it is and how they do things. But ultimately, um, the workflow, it just makes sense, right? You're doing all these different movies over a long uh, span of years as well now with the uh, streaming shows. So you have to have some sort of continuity and consistency. So um, it's it's really cool stuff. So hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed that as well. And uh, again, I really look forward to having Jacob back on the program down the road as well. I feel very fortunate this last uh, eight months having a lot of talented filmmakers on this program. Uh, it's really good to see between documentarians uh, as well as uh, independent and, and much larger budgeted film uh, directors. Uh, you just kind of get you know an idea as to how things work um, on all these different movies. Uh, so uh, again, if you're a new listener to the program, uh, you should definitely check out my previous shows. Uh, you have 27 originals or well, you have 27 uh, shows, one best of, and um, actually that kind of segues me right now into uh, what I was talking about at the top of the program. So uh, March of 2021 is the beginning of the third year that the Graveyard Show podcast is online. And when I did the first version of the show, it was from 29, uh, 2009 to uh, 2010. Uh, there's plenty of information on my previous podcast about the whole history, all that stuff. I'm not going to bore everybody who are regular listeners with that. Uh, I put the show to bed for about 10 years, decided to resurrect it back in 2019 because uh, none of the shows existed online. And I had 70, I think it was like 76 shows that um, between myself and uh, The Undertaker, who was the fill-in host for me, uh, we did uh, about 76 shows in total, I think it was, when the show finally came to a conclusion. And there was nowhere for these shows to be found. So when I resurrected the graveyard show, reopened my gates to the graveyard, um, I did it specifically to uh, feature interviews from 2009 and 2010. And I decided to do some new wraps around it, uh, open new opens, new closes, all that stuff. Um, but by August... Uh, of 2020, I, I had kind of figured out what I wanted to do, uh, getting back into the game of doing original interviews. So once I had figured that out, I thought, you know what, it's time to just get right back into it. And um, when I started doing original interviews again, starting on Tombstone 17, the idea was that I was going to uh, maybe re-air some of the other old interviews that I had as a just-in-case, because I really wasn't sure how things would go getting back into the original interview game. Well, it's turned out that it's been incredibly great and a lot of fun, and I'm going to be really honest. I'm not looking to go back anymore on the Graveyard Show podcast looking back at old interviews. So what I decided to do was, uh, with the Graveyard Show podcast's YouTube channel, I've already started a new show on there called Catacombs of Horror, which is a different type of show. Well, now in addition to the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel, I'm going to start uploading old interviews from the 2009-2010 run. It's going to be just the interviews, uh, nothing else. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, the original open and the original close. That's it. I'm not going to keep um, all the talking and everything else from those shows in there. I'm just going to edit the top, the tail, put it on the interview, and that's it. It's going to be really easy breezy. So uh, you could check out the um, what I'm calling the GYS Classic uh, playlist on the Graveyard Show Podcast YouTube channel. And I thought, why not start with uh, my interview with the queen of Bay Area horror, Miss Rainy Young. Uh, it will be uh, her interview that's going to be the first one up there right now. It's from uh, Graveyard Show podcast number 13 or 14. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, it was her first appearance on here, and um, it was the first of three times she was on the program. 
I also figured since her since this interview was supposed to be originally on Tombstone 17, I thought let's just get this up here. Uh, so that will be the first of the GYS Classic uh, playlist uh, podcasts that you can find on the Graveyard Show podcast YouTube channel. So check it out when you can. So you have uh, this show on there. You have Catacombs of Horror on there, which is YouTube exclusive, and then the GYS Classics, which will also be YouTube exclusive. So if you haven't signed up to the Graveyard Show podcast on YouTube, check it out and if you like it hey subscribe and hit some likes on on there as well i would really appreciate that too by the way um if you ever get a chance to review or rate the show on any of the podcasting um sites you're listening to it uh, i would really appreciate that as well i know i've never asked for that prior um, but i thought i would this time if if you get the chance i would really appreciate it as well just a little something would be nice. Uh, the show is free, right? <laughs> okay, so enough about that. Let's get into some uh, quick news and notes. Uh, IFC Films has nabbed the modern day whodunit horror film called Werewolves Within. Uh, it is uh, Josh Rubin's newest film. Uh, Josh Rubin, of course, uh, directed the film Scare Me, and he co-starred in it. Uh, which you can still catch on Shutter right now. His new film is uh, starring Sam Richardson, uh, of course, from Veep, and um, the cast is huge. So check it out. Um, you can find it online. I re- actually read about this on Bloody Disgusting. So there you go. A little, a little, a little more free publicity for those that don't need it. <laughs> uh, you can check it out there or any of your favorite horror sites. I'm sure everybody has it. Um, but uh, yeah, IFC grabbed it. And they will be uh, releasing the film theatrically on uh, June 25th. And it's also going to be available on demand and digital platforms uh, starting July 2nd of this year. So uh, I can't wait. I was uh, really uh, a fan of uh, Scare Me. If you haven't checked that out, check it out. It's on Shutter. In the meantime, next program, the Graveyard Show podcast. It is a first which I'll get to in just a second. The Graveyard Show Podcast. <laughs> Again, I'm all over the place today. Uh, the Graveyard Show Podcast uh, is available on Apple uh, Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, uh, Anchor, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and uh, everywhere that podcasts exist. And as I just mentioned uh, about two seconds ago, the show is also available on YouTube as well, just in case you weren't paying attention the last five or six minutes. Uh, anyway, and um, if you know of any fans of horror, please invite them to enter the graveyard new listeners and friends are always welcome so next show it is going to be a first for the graveyard show podcast uh i am going to be joined by the two men that make up the band weary pines i'm talking about uh don mclennan jr as well as jamie chambers And um, if you're not familiar with the name, well, you're going to be familiar with the movies that they're associated with. In Search of Darkness Parts 1 and Part 2, if you've seen either or both, well, they provided the score for both those movies. So uh, Jamie and Don are going to be joining me from the UK. It's the first time ever that I'll be interviewing anyone outside the States on this program. It's a first. We've been talking about doing it for a few months now. And uh, we've just solidified a date to do the interview, and I am excited. They are awesome. And uh, you can check them out at wearypines.com. That's W-E-A-R-Y-P-I-N-E-S.com. You can check out their stuff on there. Uh, You can obviously find them on Spotify. You can find the uh, score for In Search of Darkness on there. Uh, And... um, Check it out. They're incredibly talented uh, duo, and I can't wait to talk to them about um, scoring the film as well as um, uh, working in the music business and uh, creating music. It's something that I'm a really big fan of. So uh, check it out. Weary Pines next show. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.